I invite you to take your Bibles now in hand and turn with me to Psalms 94, and we'll be reading verse 1 through 15. Again, Psalms 94, verse 1 through 15. Here's what the word of the Lord says this morning. O Lord, God of vengeance, O God of vengeance, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth. Repay to the proud what they deserve. O Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exult? They pour out their arrogant words. All the evildoers boast. They crush your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They kill the widow and the sojourner and murder the fatherless. And they say, the Lord does not see, the God of Jacob does not perceive. Understand, O dullest of the people, fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who disciplines the nations, does he not rebuke? He who teaches man knowledge, the Lord, knows the thoughts of man, and they are but a breath. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law, to give him rest from days of trouble, until a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not forsake his people, he will not abandon his heritage. For justice will return to the righteous, and all the upright in heart will follow it. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these words that you have had the psalmist write to us to remind us yet of your character, of how great a God you are. Lord God, we ask you now to open our eyes to see you, open our ears to hear from you, and give us the courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning we resume our series on the names of God, and we have three names left to look at. This morning we're looking at the name Shaphet. Now, what is this word? Well, it actually comes from verse 2 of our passage this morning, which says again, Rise up, O judge of the earth. Repay to the proud what they deserve. This word shofet is actually the English word here, judge. Rise up, O judge of the earth. I'm reminded of a story, actually a video clip that I had seen not too long ago, of a judge who's sitting on his, his judgment seat, and there's a gentleman who's standing before him who had been accused of stealing, or sorry, not of stealing, of speeding. He's standing there with his wife and his children. And the judge and, and this young man were having a discussion together. The judge was asking questions. He'd answer them. And finally, halfway through this interchange, the young man was definitely honest about that he was guilty. They had sped, but had given some reasons to why he sped. And halfway through this, he says, bring your, your young boy he must have been about three, maybe four years old. Have him come up and have him sit on my lap for a moment. So the bailiff directs the, the boy and, and the father's obviously nervous as he's standing before the judge. And so the little boy sits on the judge's lap and the judge shows kindness and gentleness in talking to him and asks him, no, I'd, I'd like to ask you a question. Is, is your dad guilty of speeding? And the little boy says, sits there and says, yeah, he's guilty. The courtroom, which is a small room, bursts out in laughter. And, and the father again is laughing, but it's a nervous laugh because uh, he's not sure how this is going to go yet. And the camera spans back to the, the judge and, and the son. Well, then should he have to pay, should be punished for breaking the law? And the son agreed that he should be punished. Again, laughter through the room. The judge then turns to, to the father and says to him, I appreciate your son's honesty, and, and I, I believe you're, you're genuine too. 
And so I'm going to delete your fine. I can see the relief on the father's face. The picture of this judge is kind of how I picture God in a way. Yes, he's there to bring about justice, but there's a kindness to this judge still too. He is a holy God, a righteous judge, but he still is a loving, kind God. Today we're looking at this name, Shaphet, the judge, the ultimate judge of all. And there's one point we're going to look at this morning, and is this, that God is judge. He is judge. You know, there are people in this world who says that, how could God be just? Like, look around you. Why did he allow COVID to happen? And why does he allow young children to be harmed by other people? What? Why does God allow this or that to happen? Why, why doesn't he stop it from happening? Well, they forget sometimes that the, the job of a judge is to bring judgment. The judge, when he stands um, in the streets and sees a crime, he's not the one who arrests them and makes the pronouncement on the spot or even tries to stop the person from committing the crime. But he's the one who makes the judgment after all the evidence is brought before him. God is like that judge. He examines the evidence that is against all. And don't we, we must understand that God someday is going to judge everyone before his throne. This term, Shofet, judge, what does this term fully mean then? Well, there's a couple, couple aspects to this name, Shofet. And by the way, Shofet, judge, is actually a verb, but in this case, it has been used as a noun. And again, the psalmist is using this noun of God. He's talking to God and saying, you, O judge, judge used as a noun, a name of God. So this name judge means to judge or even to governor, to govern in a situation. And that's what a judge does in a situation. They govern the situation. They assess what is the evidence. Has the person committed the crime or not? but also means to discriminate between persons. In our culture, we don't like this term discriminate, do we? Now, there's certain contexts that, yes, it's not good to discriminate, but there is a positive side of that word, though, too. Our world does want justice. When something is done wrong, people want to see them pay for it, and they're actually discriminating against that person, but it's a right way of discrimination. We don't want someone to cause harm to our children. We want women to be protected from awful men. So we do see that people want right things to do. They are discriminating. And that's what God does. He discriminates between what is right and what is wrong. Between the wrongdoer and the righteous person. This is the kind of discrimination we need to understand. And the right kind of discrimination that God does to do what is just. This term also means dealing with religious questions. In other words, in regards to morality, what is right and what is wrong. And then to ex execute judgment. So God, the name judge given here, speaks to giving judgment, executing upon those who have broken his law. In this psalm this morning, Psalm 94, the psalmist is crying out to God and saying, God, bring about your justice because the evil people are doing wrong against your people. And so, Lord God, bring about your justice and then calls those who are doing the wicked foolish. Why are you doing these things? Because God's going to bring his judgment upon you at some point and God's going to protect those who are righteous. He's going to bring justice for them. This is a great call and a warning for for those who are not yet Christians too, God is going to bring his judgments to you someday. The question is, do you want to receive his forgiveness or face his punishment on judgment day? We see this again in the courtroom scene. In the courtroom, when someone is brought in on charges of something, 
they stand as the defendant. And then there's a product you see an attorney who's bringing the charges and the evidence against the defendant. And the defendant, if they're not guilty, will, will try to defend and say, no, I'm not guilty. If they're guilty, hopefully they would be honest and say, I am guilty of breaking this law. And the judge will be determined based on the evidence brought and saying, you are guilty or not guilty. And if you are guilty, here's the punishment for your crime. God will do that on judgment day before his throne. Because he is a just God. Again, God is Shofet. God is judge. There's four things that we see about God being judge. And that is this. Judge judges justly. <laughs> Say that with ten ten fast, eh? The tongue twister in itself. God, who is judge, judges justly. In Revelation 19, verse 2, it says this. For his judgments are true and just. They are just. Why are his, are his judgments just? Because the next part, judge justice truly. Well, what does it mean that God judges truly? Well, it means this, is that it means that God has established what the law is. And so he tells us, he even tells us in his word, these are the things that are sin. These are the things that break our relationship between you and I and yourself and others. So here's what is right. And God describes that in the Ten Commandments for one. Um, there's the commandment that we're not to murder. But you know what? Actually, Jesus takes the standard further and says, you know what? If you hate someone in your heart, you have broken the law. You've murdered them in your own heart. God's word tells us not to, have them, to commit adultery. But Jesus, again, with that one, raises a standard and says, if you lust after another person, you've committed adultery in your heart. Another One of the Ten Commandments, if you covet after another person, what they have, you're sinning against God. If you steal or if you lie, that's breaking God's moral code, his moral law. If you use the name as a cuss word, you're breaking his law. If you worship something else or put something else in place of him, you are breaking God's law. We have done what we call sin, what God calls sin. And so God was the one who has established the standard and so because of that, he judges by that. And that's why he's able to judge truly. And that's why he judges justly as well. Fourth thing we know about the judge is that the judge judges with righteousness. Yes, he meets the standard because he is the standard. He is righteous. He is holy. And so he can make the standard for us. And he doesn't break that standard himself. He's the perfect example of that. Yeah, some will argue and say, well, what about the mass extinction God did of the Canaanites? Well, do not forget that they're under God's judgment because of their sin. They're worshiping other gods, including a god named Molech, which part of worshiping that god, that demon, meant sacrificing their children to that God. People say we want justice. There's an example of God bringing about justice. God judges with righteousness. 2 Timothy 4 verse 8 says this, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all, who have loved his appearing. The Apostle Paul writes in his letter to Timothy here and mentions again that God is a righteous judge. And he was looking for the crown of righteousness that God would give him because he had placed his faith in Jesus and mentions about how all those who also appear love God's appearing. Someday Jesus is going to come. God's word tells us he's going to come again as judge of this world. He's going to come in the clouds. And there are some who are going to see him in the clouds who are going to be like, going, yes, he's coming. I get to go home to heaven. Those are who Paul's talking about, who love God's appearing. 
For those it's red, though, who don't know Christ. Those who don't know Christ know that they'll be standing before God and being judged for their sins then and going, oh, man, this is a terrible day. Man, I wish I made the right decision before now. Which leads us to the fourth thing about our judge. The judge judges the wicked. It is a scary day when we stand before God's throne for those who do not yet know Christ because God is going to judge the wicked. 1 Peter 4, verse 4 to 6 says this. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. And then in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 13, God judges those outside. Who are those outside? Those who are outside the church. I'm not talking about those who attend church because there's Christians, there's sometimes people who aren't Christians who attend a church service. The true church are those who have made a confession of faith before Jesus Christ. So then those who are outside the church aren't those who aren't true Christians. There are those who have not repented of their sins and have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter and Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 mentions about those who, who are not children of God yet. When Christ returns, he's going to judge them. He's going to judge them for their sins and for the wickedness. So God, the judge, judges the wicked. There's a question I'd like to pose to those of you who are watching this right now who are not yet a Christian. You have not made a confession of faith to Jesus, meaning that you have confessed your sins, placed your faith in him, and surrendered your life to him. If you haven't, someday God's going to come here and take us before his throne and judge us. To those on his right, God's going to judge those who are righteous on his right and saying that because they've come to faith in him, they've received Christ's gift of salvation. Come and enter the joy of your master. Because Jesus died and you accepted him as Lord and Savior. But to those on the left, those who are guilty of sin, who have not come to faith in Jesus Christ, he'll say, you have not repented of your sin. You have not turned to Jesus and turned your life to him. And so then you'll spend eternity in hell. Any crime you've committed against God, his sin against him. We went through a list of those moments ago, the Ten Commandments. If you have broken God's law and you have not confessed your sins to him, you're in danger of facing God's judgment. And remember that God will judge justly. He will judge with truth. God will judge those who have not accepted his gift of salvation. I'll share with you in a few moments of how you can receive his gift of salvation. It's important for all of people to understand God's name, Shaphat. To know that he is the judge and that he will judge justly and rightly. It's like this. Mind of a story, another judge and courtroom scene. Story of a judge who had been doing some judgments through the day. And he shot all of a sudden when one person comes through the door and stands at the defendant's table. On the other table is the prosecution, prosecuting lawyers. And this man who is the defendant standing before the judge was his own son. He had been in trouble with the law before, and so it wasn't surprised he was there, but surprised to see his son come into his courtroom. The prosecutors brought the evidence before the judge of the crimes his son has committed. And the son had admitted that he had committed the crime. The judge then then said, you are guilty of breaking this law. And your fine is this much money. It was no small amount. 
was a great amount of money. And then he stood up, took off his robe, placed it on his chair and walked down to his son. And then he gave the money to the bailiff and said, here's the money to pay for his crime. We see in this story that the judge was just. His son was guilty, declared guilty, and the fine was declared. So justice was fulfilled. But then the judge then paid for the fine. Again, fulfilling justice. That's what God has done for us. That's what Jesus did for us at the cross. He took the Father's full wrath upon himself and said, I'm going to pay the fine for your sin. No matter what your sin was, whether it's stealing or lying. By the way, all of us have lied. God paid the fine in Jesus for our sin. He went to the cross and died on the cross for our sins, paying for our debt. And then three days later rose from the dead to offer us his free gift of salvation. Jesus says to you, confess your sins, place your faith in me and surrender to me, and you'll be saved. You'll be my child, and you'll have an eternity in heaven. I want to talk again to those of you who are unsaved for a moment now. Where, how will you stand before God on Judgment Day? Will you be with those who are Christians who have said, Lord Jesus, I believe that I'm a sinner. I understand that you are my Savior who died on the cross for my place for my sins. So I don't have to face an eternity in hell, but can, but can have an eternity in heaven with you. If you have made something like that, said something like that, come into Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I confess my sins to you, I place my faith in you, and choose from this moment on to make you Lord of my life, to follow you and obey you in all things. If you have prayed a prayer like that, then you are with the righteous Christians. But if you haven't made that decision yet to follow Christ, if you don't receive Christ before your death or before he returns, you'll stand before him on the left and marked with the wicked. And God will say, you were guilty of breaking my law. And the punishment now is eternity in hell, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, where there's torment for eternity. I pray that you will receive Christ as your Lord and Savior in this moment. And I ask you this question, what is hindering you from receiving Christ this morning? I tell you, there can't be anything good enough. No good enough excuse to get in the way of receiving Christ now. If you want to receive Christ, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I believe that I'm a sinner. I recognize that I've broken your moral law. I recognize that I deserve an eternity in hell for my sin. But I understand and recognize that you, Jesus, are Savior, that you took my place on the cross and died for me and rose three days later to offer me your gift of salvation. So, Lord Jesus, I confess to you my sin and I ask you to forgive my sins. I pray this in faith, believing that you can and will and have now forgiven my sins. And my pledge to you from this moment on is to surrender my life to you, to obey you, to depend on your spirit to overcome all temptation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you have prayed that prayer or a prayer like that, know that you are saved from your sins. And don't have to worry about hell anymore and the consequences of your sin, but you have an eternity in heaven with the church. You are now a part of the church. And if you have prayed that prayer or would like to talk further about how to receive Christ, I invite you to contact me by email at nlchristiancommunity.com or, sorry, nlchristiancommunity at gmail.com or by phone at 780-660-4153. And I'd love to take the time to encourage you in your newfound faith and to talk with you about the new next steps you need to take to grow in your newfound faith in Jesus Christ, to be a part of a community, part of the body of Christ. 
coming to faith in Christ is the most important decision you can ever make. So I encourage you to follow in his footsteps. Come to faith in him. Well, there's two points of action I want to call us to this morning. First is this. Give thanks to God, for he judges those who do evil against you. God is the just judge, and God will stand in the gap for you when others have done wrong against you. Place him in God's hand. Second point of action is give thanks that you are not under God's wrath, but now you're his child. As we recognize and give thanks in these two ways, may we remember, though, too, that God is a merciful God. And that maybe his justice has to do with a person coming to faith and asking to be right with, the, with God and with us. So recognize that God's justice might play out in that way instead. And may we pray to that end, too. So here's the challenge for us. To pray for those who do evil against us. That, first of all, that they would come to faith in Jesus Christ and make things right with God and with us. And if not, they will face God's judgment someday on Judgment Day. Know that God is your defender, because he is judge. He is Shofet, who is a judge of all things. So may we leave the judging up to God. How do you want to face judge on on someday? Is it with his wrath or is it with his grace? It is up to you how you face God on Judgment Day. May you face him, hopefully with his grace and not with his wrath. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your love and your grace and how mighty and awesome a God you are. How you are not only loving, but you are still just. You are holy. And Lord, you fulfill your justice always. Lord, thank you for how you fulfilled your just, justice at the cross and offered us your gift of salvation. Again, fulfilling justice, proving that you're holy and that you are love. God, you are a good God. We praise you. Amen. In closing, we're going to sing a song called From the Inside Out. And may we sing this song of praise in closing, a song of surrender to him. And even a part of this song, speaks of how God brings his justice too, because he is a just God. Let us sing this song of praise to him now.